Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, cause Jesus is the way. Today we're going to be talking about problem marriages. Why is it that people get married? Usually it's to form a team that will meet both of their needs better. It's a blood covenant, an alliance for the good of both. They expect the team to serve their best interest. They expect that they will receive as well as give. They expect things will be fair and their needs will be met. But does that usually happen? Not initially. There are struggles, there are problems, there are things that go on. We talked earlier about the fact that offenses happen. Stuff happens, right? And we want to take a look at something to start out with, a sort of a classical problem marriage and how you go from being madly in love and believing that this is the greatest person that walks on the face of the earth and they can do no wrong to seeing them as the devil themselves and uh, hating their guts. How does that happen? Well, there's a path called the path of disaffection. And this comes out of the book Before a Bad Goodbye. We want to look at that a little bit. And what I want to ask you, if you ever had any struggles in your marriage, think about these different steps and then think about where do you fit into this? Because you might be surprised, maybe your marriage is starting to fall apart and you don't even know that it's falling apart. The first thing that happens in the path of disaffection is called distancing. And distancing really begins when you begin to question whether your mate has your best interest in mind. Remember that line? What they call level one distancing is ending thoughtful acts. See, think about your marriage. Are you just thinking about neat, wonderful things to do for your mate? Well, if you quit doing that, that's already a sign that things are starting to come apart. The next level is you are unhappy with your marriage. You just know for some reason you're just not happy in the marriage. Maybe you don't feel loved. Maybe you don't feel respected. There could be all sorts of different reasons, but you find that you're just unhappy in your marriage. Then we come to the cycle of disaffection. In the cycle of disaffection, in the first step, we have increasing dissatisfaction. And then we have what's been called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. What are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Who knows? Remember, that's the beginning of the what? Yeah. Tribulation period. And this is the beginning of the tribulation period. And if you start seeing criticism, contempt especially. What's contempt? I not only criticize you, but I put you down. I act like you're not worthy to be alive. Defensiveness and stonewalling. When you see those three things, those things start happening. And when those happen, then we go to step two of this cycle, raising the bar. And the first is love traps. Love traps are when you say, you know what? I'm not sure if my husband loves me, but if he brings me two red roses, one yellow rose and one blue rose at 2.56 in the morning, then I'll know he loves me. But if he doesn't, then he must not love me. So the little tests that you run to see if you really believe that your mate loves you or not. Now, what's wrong with those tests? Many times they're not anything that anybody is going to think, especially for ladies, they usually think he ought to know. If he just knows how I'm feeling. <laughs> Guys don't just know how you're feeling. I hate to tell you that. And they convince themselves through that that they're not loved. Remember what I said about love? If a woman feels loved, she'll do anything for a man. If a man feels appreciated, she'll do anything for a woman. Or we're going the wrong direction. Step three, sensing failure. Increase guilt in sulking. Now, why do people go around sulking? They're hoping the other person says, Oh, you're sulking. What did I do wrong? Can I help you? When you go around moping around the house, what does the average guy think? She's just telling me I failed again. 
Then it goes to step four, negatively evaluating everything that goes on. Negative thoughts. So as you're taking everything and you're seeing it in the worst way. They really meant that. I know when he tripped me, he did that on purpose. Less willing to invest. Well, if they're not going to do anything in this marriage, forget it. Then I'm not going to do anything in this marriage. If they don't care, well, then I don't care. They reject me, I'm going to reject you, right? Step five, increasing self-preservation. The mate becomes the villain. If I could just fix my mate, everything would be okay. It's all their fault, but it's never going to happen. I mean, how in the world did I ever get into this thing? Eternal vigilance. I've got to watch out because if I don't, I'm going to get hurt. And that cycle goes around and around and around, getting worse and worse and worse every time it goes around that cycle. Then we come to unmet needs. So now because you're not meeting the other one's needs, you're not doing those nice things, you're not really caring, you're dividing, you're separating yourselves, we get strong emotions and filling the gap. Filling the gap is when you might have an affair, when you might get another project, get another hobby, stay at work longer, do other things to just fill my own needs. Going out with your friends all the time. Just not getting your needs met in this relationship. Then we have a downward spiritual spiral. Because are you supposed to be doing this stuff you're doing? No. So guess what you say? Well, God understands. He knows I have to get my needs met. I've got to take care of myself living with this guy or this girl. So sin against the spouse is not confessed. They're not saying, you know, God said I'm supposed to love them unconditionally or I'm supposed to respect them unconditionally. It's okay by God. We all understand that, right? Now, when you start talking to God that way, what happens? Your relationship with God starts coming apart and you don't have that closeness anymore. Then we get to polarization. Hopelessness and helplessness. And a power struggle. If you're not going to take care of me, I got to take care of myself. I'm going to look out for number one. And both people are looking out for number one. And finally, we end up at the bottom of your chart here. Islands of me. You're both on your separate islands. You have your guns cocked. You're waiting for the next attack. Deep pain. All I want to do is be safe in this relationship. Do you see how this whole thing all falls apart? Now, I want to be talking about how to put it back together in another lecture, but I just want to show you sort of a model of how things go and how they fall apart. Now, in another class, we talked about this and we used the model of David and Michael. Let me review that just for a couple seconds here. You remember what happened? They were so madly in love that David went out and killed 200 Philistines when he only had to kill 100 to get Michael, right? And Michael was so madly in love, she took her own life in her hands to lie about David and let David escape with his life from her dad. And then she was given to Philaetil after David was running for his life. But after David finally won the kingdom back, David said, I want Michael back. And he made it part of a peace treaty. How well do you think Michael took that? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. It just says that Philaetil followed Michael crying all the way until Abner basically said, go home or I take your head off. The next part of this, I want you to follow this. Do you see what's going on? Okay. David comes in dancing before the ark, right? And the Bible says, Michael looked out the window and had contempt for him. So where are we in the chart? Do you see, we're at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Things are falling apart. And when David comes home and Michael says something, does David handle it well? Absolutely not. David says, you know what? God chose me over your dad. 
And if I want to dance with my shirt off in front of all the ladies of the country, I'll even do it more. In other words, in your face. And the Bible says after that, Michael never had any children. What does that tell us? The sexual relationship fell apart, right? And ten years later, David is up on top of the castle wall and happens to see a young lady taking a bath by the name of Bathsheba. Where are we in the chart now? Unmet needs, aren't we? In those ten years we went around this cycle, went around this cycle, and now David's meeting his unmet needs. And then how about downward spiritual spiral? Well, think about this. Remember that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is so noble that he won't go home and sleep with her, so David's going to get caught. So David kills Uriah. Would we say that's a fairly downward spiritual spiral for this man of God? And he's so messed up that Nathan has to come and use a subterfuge to get him to confess his sin. Do you see that happening? And then what happens? Well, later on, there's the famine in the land. And due to the famine in the land, David goes to God and God says, because of the way Saul treated the Gibeonites, and so he has to hang seven sons of Saul to appease the Gibeonites, and he hangs the adopted children of Michael. Can you get any worse than that? Do you see how the thing just falls apart? Do you see how it just follows this whole thing? They're now down here at the islands of Mead, deep pain. They just want to be safe. Do you see how that happens? What I want to bring to your attention besides that, that's the beginning to get an idea how this happens, I want to talk about a fairly large number of classical marriage problems, or what we might call problem marriages. These are going to be certain ones that you need to remember because you're going to see them happen right in front of your eyes. And when you see them, you'll have some ideas of what to do about them or at least recognize, okay, this is a classical type of problem that we see because marriages sort of self-destruct in different consistent ways and for particular configurations and particular things of the way people connect with each other. So let's look at some of those. And what I'm going to do is break them down according to that list. Remember, I gave you a list of the different complaints people have about marriages, and there were 10 of those. Well, I'm going to break down the problem marriages according to those same categories. The first category, and these come out of uh, a pursuit of intimacy, by the way, is lack of communication. The first lack of communication marriage that's a problem is, let's call it the avoidant marriage. This is the one where both of them are so afraid that maybe the other one really doesn't care for them, or if they rock the boat, the other one's going to abandon them. They avoid discussing things. So whatever comes up, they just sort of put up with it and bury it, because they're afraid to rock the boat. And what do you think happens? Remember the dead cats? If you keep throwing the dead cats under the carpet and stomp them down long enough, what happens to the marriage? I'll give you a couple examples of that. In one particular problem, marriage like this, where they were avoiding things, the wife was so afraid her husband might do something that she just buried her head in the sand until she found out that he had a goal to sleep with every prostitute in town. But see, she was hiding, wasn't looking at the signs. The signs were there. She got so mad, she took a tire iron, broke every window out of her house, and chased him down the street with it. Another one, problem marriage. They were so afraid that the other one didn't care for them, it turned out later on that I was able to determine that this guy was a pedophile. But again, see, they were burying everything. There were signs there, and they were burying everything, and because they bury it, it eventually becomes something huge and very destructive to the marriage. The next one is the non-communicative marriage. This one, usually it's the guy who's not communicating, but it could be the gal. And why don't they communicate? Because they don't believe they can ever win. 
They believe whatever they say, they're going to be wrong or they're going to be discounted or they're going to be put down. So do they want to talk? In a marriage, especially if uh, there's no communication, how does the woman usually feel? Unloved, abandoned, because she has to talk to connect. And that's what she thinks talking is all about. I had one particular guy that was so non-communicative that I could maybe get three lines out of him in an entire counseling session. But why? He believed there's no way of this working out, so why should he talk? He had no reason to talk about it. But that also causes tremendous destruction. The next category is constant arguments. And there are a number of these. The first one from your textbook, Love and Respect, this is called the crazy cycle, isn't it? In the crazy cycle, they're both demanding, love me, or I'll punch your lights out. Respect me, or I'll punch your lights out. They're trying to make the other person love and respect them. And, and as long as they stay in that crazy cycle, remember the paradox of love? If you demand love or you look for it, you never get it. It's only when you give it away liberally, unconditionally that you get it back. This violates that whole thing, doesn't it? And usually if you tell them, well, you just need to love your mate, what do they say? They'll never change. It's hopeless. They don't really care. It's all those perceptions. And we have approach avoidance. Approach avoidance is sort of interesting because it's the opposite of what you think it is. It's again a person desperate for love. So when they don't feel love, they feel they're not important, that the other one doesn't care about them. What do they do? They actually distance themselves further in the hope that that other person is going to chase them and follow them. Their attachment alarm goes off. Remember attachment? Ding, 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 ding. Too much distance. But what is the other one? feel. They don't want to be in this relationship. I'm being abandoned. And so that whole one melts down. And you see that quite often. Hey, the fights are about that distance in the relationship, but when the other one distance, it's misinterpreted, so they distance further. And you have two people. Worst case of that I ever saw, they hadn't talked to each other for a year. They were still married because they were Christians. They had literally had no contact with each other for a year. And it was this situation because uh, one of them felt the other one didn't care, so they didn't talk to him. The other one felt they didn't care, so they didn't talk to him. And it was a year later before they came in for counseling. Another one, let's just call the war. Many times this is after somebody has threatened divorce. And how do you feel if somebody is threatening a divorce? They're out to get me. We're down here at Islands of Me, aren't we? So I got my guns loaded, and I've seen a man just horrendous things done at this particular level in the war. He did everything he could to destroy her job and make sure she got fired. They were sending letters to all their kids and all their friends about their sex life. In one case, the guy was a lawyer and they were doing all this lawyer stuff back and forth of all these suits and lawsuits and all this stuff. If you want to see a mess, try a war. Because they're really hurting. What do you have to do? Get a truce. <laughs> try to help them. It can really make a big difference. In one couple like that, they're at war, they were going on vacation. So I said, well, we need a truce. You're going to have the worst vacation you ever had in your life. So let's just quit the war right now. You can come back to counseling after you come back from your vacation. They had the best vacation they ever had when they finally quit the war and they realized they did really care. Do you notice a lot of this stuff is perceptions, isn't it? It's how the person is seeing it and they wrongly interpret the other person and what's going on. And many times marriages fall apart and dissolve when they shouldn't at all. The sexually conflicted marriage. This is something that's sort of very interesting. Because as a counselor, you're going to get two situations that come in. 
You got ladies that come in, they're going to say, he just over sex. That's all he wants is sex. That's all marriage is about to him is sex. He really doesn't love me. And you get a whole other set of ladies that come in and say, he never wants any sex. I don't feel like I'm okay. I feel like I'm worthless, that I don't count for anything because he doesn't chase me. So which one's the situation? They both are. I had one particular couple that we figured out eventually by doing layer caking that every fight they ever had had to do with sex. Because see, to him, love equaled sex. So if she wasn't up for sex, how did he feel? So what would happen is that he would go and do all this stuff for her. I mean, he was doing all this, cleaning the house for her, doing all sorts of things that maybe he shouldn't have even been doing. And he would continue to do that and it was all fine. But then if he didn't get sex, he felt she didn't love him, so she didn't appreciate all the stuff he was doing and he would get more and more critical until they had some big fight. Then they would come in, we would figure out what the fight was about once we finally got to the bottom of it. It all came down to the fact that he didn't have sex. So what do we have to do? Set some boundary lines. That basically, uh, he could initiate sex. If she wasn't up for it, that was okay, but she gave a rain check. But if they got to over a week with no sex, he could call an emergency session. <laughs> However, we had to go the other way too. <laughs> yes, had to go the other way too. If he got mad and blew up during the week because she said no, the week started over. <laughs> but you have to sort those things out and they have to see what's going on. And it came back to the fact that to him growing up, sex equal love. So he felt unloved. And so he reacted because of that. The wounded bird. Now the wounded bird is, I will rescue you so you will love me. If they're in this configuration, one is the rescuer and the other is the victim, right? Now what's the problem with that? If their relationship is based on that configuration, what is the problem? What if the wounded bird gets healthy? In fact, there's a vested interest in the couple to ensure that the wounded bird never gets healthy. See the problem? So you're actually working against healthiness because their marriage might fall apart because that was the basis. Dysfunction, if we don't have dysfunction, that's what this marriage is based on. So these things can all turn around and be the wrong direction. Marriage deadlock. And by the way, these are unfulfilled needs we're talking about now. Do you remember the four-foot chopstick story? That's the story. Basically, if you meet my needs, then I'll meet your needs. But I don't really trust you to meet my needs first. You have to meet mine first, and then I'll meet yours. And you say to me, no, you meet mine first, then I'll meet yours. And we end up in marriage deadlock where neither of them will do anything in the marriage because it's all based on conditional love. Addictions. Yes, we can have an addictive marriage. We have a codependent and an addict. And what goes on? They need their drugs. They're usually enabled either by the person helping them with the drugs or the person trying to get them healed. And what do you have to do? Set good boundary lines. Codependency, we've talked about that as idolatry. That's another, a codependent marriage. Again, is where they're both leaning on each other so much that if one falls in a ditch, the other one falls in a ditch on top of them. They're so overly connected, they're constantly fighting and the needs are not being met. Why aren't the needs being met? Because they're both empty. You have two people with empty love tanks. How can they possibly fulfill the other one? Of course, what's the answer? getting God to fill their love tank, and then they have something to give to each other. The over-under-responsible marriage. This is a very usual one that you're going to see. This is usually where you have a responsibility avoidant married to a codependent, dependent rescuer. What is going to happen? 
Well, the responsibility avoidant is going to do less and less because he only takes on the things in which he can succeed so he doesn't feel like a failure. And so she's going to fill the gap and do more and more. And how is she going to feel? Overwhelmed. But if he tries to do more and more, what's going to happen? It's never going to be good enough. She's going to say, you could have done that better. Remember one of these particular marriages? We finally got the guy to go back out and cut these trees down in the backyard. And he dragged them to the porch, cut them up, you know, so the trash would take them away. She was mad at him because she had reseeded the lawn and hadn't told him, so he'd messed up the reseeding. So it seemed like there's just nothing you can do that's good enough. And so they lock each other in place. And of course, how about the rescuer? How is she feeling? He should be the leader of the family. So she's unhappy and he's unhappy because she won't let him lead. How about financial disagreements? Power struggle over money. Why? Because they either handle money differently. One's a spender, one is a saver. One usually has their security in the money or uh, they just don't believe they can trust the other person. So they're constantly fighting over the money. What do you do again? Boundaries. Try and get them to the place that they're responsible for certain things. Their money goes certain directions. They have agreements. Like one agreement might be you don't spend anything over $50 that you can't take back without the other one's permission. You have to have different rules and different ways of doing this. When we're dealing with money particularly, we, the most usual model that we use is the joint separate model, meaning that they have a joint account, everything that affects them both, they put their money in and use it for that. They both have to have permission of the other one to do something, but they both get a certain amount of spending money for their own needs. And so you sort of split that thing. In-law trouble. That's the triangle marriage. In one particular case, this lady was so dependent on her mom that her mom came over to her house and actually cleaned her house for her. And the guy, of course, wasn't too happy with this, but there was no way that he was going to get rid of mother-in-law out of right in the middle of this marriage. So they had constant fights and constant struggles in that relationship because the daughter was so overly dependent on the mother to the point that this was really the one situation where we weren't talking at codependence. This was dependent personality disorder. It was that bad because the daughter would not make any decisions without her mother involved in the thing. So instead of just having two people in the marriage, we had three people in the marriage. Unfortunately, the daughter was becoming just like the mother. So this was going to the next generation. How do you think the guy reacted? Well, angrily and eventually domestically violently. So can you see the mess that that can cause when we have that kind of thing? Infidelity in affairs. How many people do you think you're going to have coming to you that have committed adultery and they have an affair? A lot. You have to realize there are three things and they're called the three R's that it takes to have an affair. The first one is resentment. The second is rationalization. And the third is rendezvous. If you don't get together with them, obviously you can't do it. But if you don't rationalize for some reason, and there are a lot of reasons why people have affairs. Sometimes we resolve midlife crisis. Just a passion. Getting the wife's attention. To terminate the marriage. Sometimes people want to terminate the marriage, but they have no excuse to get out of the marriage, so they just have an affair, so they have an excuse to get out of the marriage. Revenge. Sustain a failing marriage. In some marriages, the other person knows they're having affairs. One of the worst cases I ever had is this lady was going out to the bars and sleeping with the guys every week. And the guy knew it, but he didn't want to lose her. The good news, we got her into counseling and got that turned around. But that's, it was sustaining the marriage by letting her continue to go to the bars and sleep with the guys at the bars. Cover up personal inabilities. Maybe I have a fear of intimacy. 
So rather than me not perform, I'll let you go out and have an affair or I'll go out and have an affair. Yearning for romance. Resolve emotional or sexual deprivation. Escape life's pressures. It can be a medication. Avoid closeness or interferes. And finally, the sexual addictive affair. But those are the kind of things, what do you do to deal with people like this? The first thing that has to happen is you must stop the affair immediately. Are you going to be able to help them if the affair is continuing? So you're going to have, they're going to have to decide. Do you want this affair? Do you want your marriage? Or do you want this affair? And you're going to have to break it off and make sure that it gets broken off some way. Confession. Now, are there some times when they shouldn't confess? When would be a case when maybe you shouldn't tell your mate? Are there such things? Only in cases where your mate might be very dysfunctional or be, and it's going to take them over the edge or they're going to lose it. But that's not to use that as an excuse. The normal thing is, yes, you've got to confess it. I've even had cases where the affair was eight years earlier. Because how are you going to feel in a relationship if you know you've had an affair on the person and the person doesn't know it? It's going to get to you and it's going to affect your marriage, isn't it? So normally you do need the confession. Of course, confession to God. And then forgiveness. You're going to also have to dig in to find out why the affair happened. Because if you don't understand it, what's the other person going to believe? It's going to happen again. So how do I know? And it can happen again and again and again. The worst situation I remember was a couple came in, he had admitted to one affair. By the time we ended the session, he admitted 22 affairs. Could that marriage be saved? It was. Just because you're in an affair doesn't mean the marriage is going to fail, but obviously we've got a problem. And if it's a series of affairs like that, you have probably a sexual addiction that is going on here or something that is going on. You're going to have to set boundaries. And then it's going to take a long time, what? Rebuilding the trust, isn't it? Because the trust is going to be shattered. Another thing that's important is I'll tell them when they come in. Don't confess a little bit now and a little bit later and a little bit later because every time you lie, that is a lack of trust. You're better off to lay it all on the table. Let's deal with it all right now. Be absolutely honest about it. And it'll be a lot easier because if you break trust 50 times, it's going to be a lot harder repairing it than if you broke in trust and lied once. So those are real issues there. Conflict about children. Blended families. How many blended families have conflict about children? What's it about? You love this one more than you love this one. But there's another type. And that is pretty much, let's call it the paycheck. You have a mom and her kids marries, have now a stepdad. How does the stepdad feel? He's just a paycheck. He's not integrated. They have their little niche over here and he's off by himself. He just makes the money and takes care of the family, but he's not really integrated into the family over here. So he feels that he doesn't really count. Give me an example of that. A particular lady, she had given up her daughter and now that her daughter was a teenager, the daughter came back to live with them and the, and the lady was trying to make up to the daughter for all the years that she hadn't had with her. What do you think happened in the marriage? Who do you think was the most important to the wife? The daughter. How do you think the guy felt? And this marriage was coming apart at the seams until one day she was talking to her mom and that's what her mom said to her. Honey, you've got to realize that you're going to have your husband a lot longer than you have your daughter. And she always realized her priorities were totally out of whack and she had to get that core marriage the priority even if she did want to make up things to her daughter. The next category is domineering spouse. You believe we might have a few of those. The first one, let's call it the power struggle. You see this because of how stubborn they are. They're not going to agree to anything. 
One particular couple, if I would talk to them in the session, I would get the one to agree to something and I would then try to get the other one to agree, that one would disagree, just because the first one agreed. And then if I would get that one to agree, the first one would no longer agree. So we solved it. When they came in, I would just say to the man, I would say, O oh, king, what are your edicts today? And he would say what he was going to do. I'm going to take over the finances. O oh, queen, if the king takes over the finances, what are you going to do? And she would say, and I'd say, now you have an agreement. It was that bad. Luckily, we got past that eventually <laughs> as to what was going on. Many times, though, this is because you have two firstborns in the relationship because they both want to lead, don't they? And they both think they have the answers because they have pioneered. I also call this the dream team. You take two people that are really successful, are really, they've been driven, they've really succeeded in life, and of course they want to marry somebody that's also very successful, right? Think about like the dream teams when we used to put those together for the Olympics. How well did they do? Had all these superheroes on these teams, and some of them lost terribly because they could never get the team together. That's the challenge. How do we form a team if they both think they're right and they both think they have all the answers and they're both afraid of what? The other one is going to dominate them. See, if I think you're going to dominate me, if I give in too much, what am I going to do? I'm not going to agree. And you can get some pretty hard-headed struggles going on here. The worst that I ever saw was the girl said this. Based on her experiences, I will never let a man control me. And based on the man's experience, he said, I will never let a woman control me. What were they saying? We're not going to let the other one influence us in this relationship. It's hard to have a team if you won't let the other one influence you. Will it? Parent-child. When you see a couple... And there's about an, over a 10-year difference in age. And particularly if all the people they connect with tend to be that length, you know, distance in age, what does that usually tell you? You've got a person that was never able to connect to their father or their mother, and so now they're setting up relationships to repeat that same situation. And what happens in a parent-child type of relationship? The parent sort of dominates and sets rules and is critical of the child and so something like they're trying to bring up their mate as a child. And does that work? Transactional analysis will tell you that if you go parent-child to somebody, they'll come back to you, parent-child. And you're going to have a conflict. You're going to have all sorts of things going on. But worse than that is master-slave. What does that look like? My way or the highway? You are in this relationship to meet my needs, to be my servant, to be my slave, to do it my way. And if you don't like it, there's the door. And this can be very, very difficult. Particular client, he was a farmer. There was only one problem. His farm never made money. Do you think she liked that? In fact, what she wanted to do is negotiate some boundaries. Uh, they could spend the summer out on the farm, but during the winter they would come to town because she worked here in town. A lot of her money was going to support this farm that wasn't making it. No way. It was either forget it, go along with me and my farm even though we're losing money every year, or too bad. Over-controlled imperative marriage. Now this is an interesting one because the over-controlling starts with the mom or the dad. They've been brought up where the parents over-controlled them. What have they not learned? Self-discipline. So now what are they like in the marriage? They don't have any self-discipline. They're either oh, they're spending, they're not taking care of their kids, they're going out with their friends, they're doing all sorts of things. And guess what kind of a person they usually marry? A controller. 
And guess how they respond to the controller? Not good. But what's interesting about this, and I'll give you a warning here. Don't think that the answer is for the controller to quit controlling. Because if they drop all control, what's going to happen? Because the other person hasn't learned self-discipline, they're going to run totally amok. I'll give you an example. This might blow your mind a little bit. But the wife calls up her husband at work and says, Husband, this old boyfriend of mine called and he wants to take me to a rock concert. Can I go? No clue at all. Had another couple like this. The fight was going on because it was more like a parent-child, but also a controller type of thing. He was trying to lower his control, but she was going out with her girlfriends to the bars all the time. Well, later on, we found out that she admitted she had two lives, that she was at the bar, she was single. She had had seven affairs. Before she finally grew up. See, what's the problem here? That person in this relationship who was over-controlled, never had a teenage. They never had a chance to make choices, to have relationships, to do things, and therefore that's what they want now. And I have to warn the spouse, hold on to your hat, because you're going to have to take this person through their teenage. You're going to have to not have those boundaries, let them make their choices, learn from their consequences, and don't think this is going to be easy or fast. This is going to be very interesting. And you're going to have to keep the balance where you don't give up total control or they're going to run totally amok. But you also can't be so controlling that they're going to totally rebel against you. This is going to be an interesting one to see how it pans out. But that's another type that you're going to see over and over again. Then we have inability to commit. I was working with a particular couple. They'd been dating for six years. And he had proposed maybe three or four times. And every time he would propose, he would have an anxiety attack and withdraw the proposal. We finally had to get to the place where they said, well, you're going to make up your mind. Are you going to do it or not do it? Well, they said, well, then we won't do it. But then they realized they really wanted to get married. So they eventually got married. About six months, I got a call and they said, why didn't we do this before? It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. But see, their fear was what? The marriage wasn't going to make it or the other person was going to dominate them. Suspicious spouse. This one you're going to see quite often, unfortunately. And that is somebody probably in either their family of origin or in their experiences has had someone have an affair on them. So in this relationship, what are they afraid of? this person is going to have an affair on them. So what do they do? Well, let's just say this is the cliff of an affair. Well, if you're going to be really safe, what could you do to make sure this will never happen? Move as far away from the cliff as you possibly can. In other words, my husband better not ever see another woman in the rest of his life. He better not ever think about another woman. He better not ever see anything on TV that's risque. He better never watch any movies. He better never... Do you see what I'm saying? It was the jealousy gets to such a point that it's a total controlling thing. One couple of this was so bad that they could not leave their house. They could not even go to church without having a major fight. They were afraid to walk through the park because they both knew what was going to happen. If a girl walked by and he looked at her, what was she going to say and believe? He's lusting after her. If he looked the other way, what was she going to believe? He's guilty. He looked the other way, obviously. <laughs> and this becomes such an obsession that that's all they're thinking about. And the anger level can get so high, uh, this one particular couple... Uh, I would get these phone calls and they'd both be on the phone and I couldn't even get a word in edgewise because they'd be screaming and yelling. One point he had even rammed the garage door and smashed in their garage door and broken all their wedding pictures. 
But the amount of anger that you get out of this thing, and usually what you get is what? A very jealous woman that is trying to control everything, and then he gets angry because he feels controlled, and they just go back and forth and back and forth. And this can be very difficult to deal with. Sometimes you even have to go to the place of getting them on some sort of medication. Because jealousy underneath is what? How I feel about myself. See, if I feel that you're better than I am, and there are 50 other guys out there that uh, you'd rather have than me, then how jealous am I going to be? So it goes down to a self-worth issue. And the final one is physical attack. Physical attack is domestic violence. It has to do with the fact that a person feels inadequate. They fear that the other person is going to abandon them. And so therefore, they try to turn them into a sniveling idiot so they won't leave. So they feel so inadequate that they don't feel they can make it on their own or they're so threatened by the threat of verbal abuse or domestic violence that they're afraid to leave. But what happens? Who just drive the person away? Like our domestic violence groups, I would say to them, look, I'll predict your future. If you keep doing this, you're going to end up divorced and in jail. And that's what happens. They actually drive the person away. The very thing they fear comes upon them and they create that very same thing. It happens in their lives. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there are some particular areas and particular configurations of marriages that are real problems that if you don't deal with them effectively, they're going to end up in a divorce. And you're going to have people coming in and your job as a counselor is to gather all the pieces. Remember last time analysis? And gather all the pieces together and from those pieces reach a conclusion of what you're dealing with. And you're going to be surprised of how many of those conclusions are going to fit these different models that I gave you here today. You're just going to say, oh, I see what that is. That's an over-under responsible marriage. That's what's going on. And then you have patterns and different things you can do to deal with those. But you've got to get a hold of it and these different problem marriages help you to understand and pick out the different configurations so you can deal with them more effectively. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you understand everything. And Lord, that you will give us the wisdom that we need. And I ask you to help every person here. Help each one of us, Lord, to recognize these problem marriages and to help those people take the actions they need to take to be delivered from this and get a healthy marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Cause Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's